everyone. Um, I hope you are starting to filter in to the webinar. If you wouldn't mind just dropping a quick hello in the chat. Oh, brilliant morning, Henna. Um, just to let me know that you can definitely see and hear me. That would be excellent. Morning, Amara. Hello. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give literally just a, a minute or so to let people filter in, um, then we will get going. So while we give that minute, I will just give a quick overview of how the session today is going to run. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware, this is episode two in our For the Love of People series. Um, this is a series that we're going to continue running over the coming months. Um, we had some really positive feedback from the first episode with People Collective. Uh, it seemed the format really appealed to all of you. Um, so I hope you're going to enjoy today's session. And we actually already have episode three uh, live and ready for registration. So I'll make sure I share that at the end. Uh, for anyone who wants to uh, sign up straight away for that one. So yeah, uh, how the session's going to run today, I'm going to start in a minute with just a very quick, no more than five or 10 minutes um, set of slides, just basically framing today's discussion. I've pulled out some stats and we're just going to do a little bit about kind of the current HR landscape, how things are looking at the moment. Um, and then following that, I will be joined by Premo, who is our guest speaker for today, and she's going to be the main part of today's webinar, where I'll be doing a fireside chat style interview with her, and she will be talking about her 20-year journey to defining people strategy. Um, we will be opening up to a viewer Q&A towards the end of the session. Don't worry, I'll give you all a nudge and a reminder uh, about that as we get closer to the time, and you'll be able to submit any questions for Premo uh, using the Q&A function. But again, I'll remind you all about that a bit later on. Um, so with that said, I, I can see we've got a, a variety of locations coming in here. Um, so I will get started in just a second. Let me just get my slides ready. Okay, hopefully you can all see those slides. Um, so yeah, For the Love of People, episode two, uh, the 20 year journey to defining people strategy. So I thought I'd just quickly introduce myself. I won't bother introducing Premo because she can do that herself in a moment. But my name is Frankie and I am the brand marketing manager here at Lattice. Um, so I cover all things content, community, comms and our wonderful For the Love of People series. Um, I joined the team about three months ago and um, yeah, I'm really enjoying getting stuck into the HR industry um, and I look forward to sort of continuing to learn about it through these uh, series of interviews and webinars. So as I said, we're just going to take a moment to sort of frame today's discussion and have a quick look at uh, the current HR, HR landscape. So this was one of the points that I really wanted to pull out. Um, current market conditions are definitely amplifying employee disconnect at work. Um, I've pulled out a couple of different stats here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 49% of employees are experiencing some degree of burnout. And pretty much everyone accepts that burnout is probably drastically underreported. So even that statistic could well be higher. Only 21% of employees are feeling engaged at work, according to a Gallup poll. And on top of that, this was actually a stat that came from our latest State of People Strategy report. 53% of HR leads are now regularly reporting on voluntary turnover to the board. And that wasn't the case in previous years. This is the first year that voluntary turnover has turned up as one of those key KPIs that's being reported on at the board level, which I think is an interesting point to take into consideration. On top of that, engagement and retention are now the top priorities for HR leaders. So 86% of HR leaders said they're putting more effort into improving employee engagement this year. 46% now have clear career growth paths to fuel employee development. That point is particularly relevant seeing as some research we ran last year highlighted that one of the core reasons given by employees for leaving a role was they felt a lack of clear career progression or growth opportunities. So the fact that HR teams are now putting that in place speaks to that retention point. And then on the right hand side there, you can see that chart. It may be a bit small on the screen for some of you, but that's one of the graphs from our recent State of People Strategy supports showing the highest priority HR initiatives. And it shows the difference there between 2021 and 2022. 
So employee engagement right at the top there, no surprises perhaps, but one of the most drastic changes was last year talent acquisition was the second highest priority for HR leaders. This year, it's dropped right down to eighth. Um, so I'm sure you're all experiencing this yourselves, but yeah, that shift from you know talent acquisition to engagement and retention, it really is changing um, how people are doing things and what the focus is for HR teams. And then, yeah, I just wanted to call out this point. I think certainly, oh, I'd hope within the HR landscape, we all understand the importance of engagement. But I think engagement can be viewed as a bit of a sort of fluffy metric uh, at times by people outside of HR. But it is proven time and time and again, engaged employees deliver more value. There is a clear business impact. Um, pulled together some stats here again. In, in, engaged teams are 21% more profitable, 17% more productive, generate 20% higher sales. You know, engagement generates real business value beyond just having happy engaged employees. Um, so I just wanted to call that out. And then on top of all that change in the industry, the role of HR teams is changing as well. Um, so a lot of HR teams are now finding they have a seat at the board or the C-suite table or certainly a prominent voice in that executive room. Um, the need to secure executive buy-in has never been more important. Um, and how do you go about framing the impact of HR initiatives in new ways, ways that are impactful to perhaps that board or C-suite level. It's quite a unique muscle to flex and not the easiest thing to do. Um, secondly, your team structures have likely been impacted. Um, lots of teams have been experiencing reductions in headcount. There's that shift from recruitment to retention that I brought up earlier. <laughs> Excuse me, hopefully once the dust settles from that, now's a really good time to reassess what's needed from your team. Um, and that's an interesting kind of challenge that a lot of HR teams are facing right now. Finally, expectations of employees may have changed. Um, in the current macroeconomic climate, business leaders will be keenly focused on productivity and performance management. Um, and how do you as HR teams maintain that strong engagement and positive morale in uncertain times when you may be dealing with at times conflicting priorities in terms of what's needed and wanted from your employees versus what's needed and wanted from the board and your executives? Um, so it's an interesting time to be a HR practitioner. Um, a hell of a lot of change going on. Um, but I think that frames kind of our discussion for today uh, really nicely. Um, so as I said, uh, following my short slides, I will now welcome Premo to the stage. Um, and we will get started with the main portion of our um, interview. Welcome, Premo. Hi, Frankie. Thank you so much. Good morning. You're Good morning, You're everyone. You're so welcome. Uh, Premo, if you wouldn't mind just starting off by giving us a quick introduction. Okay, so um, I'm Premo Ojokojo, um, the Head of People Operations at Azo Finance, which is a fintech that offers faster, less expensive, and streamlined financial services that um, the goal is to empower businesses to move money, um, exchange currencies, make payments and basically settle easily across African and G20 currencies, even digital currencies. Um, my role here um, at Azo Finance is mainly to focus on our internal team and really nurture the experience of the individuals we hire, um, ensuring that they can bring their best selves to work on a daily basis. Um, our goal as a company is to ensure um, that we provide our employees with the tools um, to succeed, not only in their roles, but also in their personal lives, you know, so um, I think that in a nutshell talks, says a bit about who I am and what I do. Brilliant. Thank you, Premo. And I mean, obviously, we, we said it as the headline title of this yeah. webinar. You've said it's taken you, you know, 20 years to properly define your people strategy and, and yeah. culture over the course of your career. Yeah. What, what took you so long? You know, what, what was that journey <laughs> like? OK, so, um, you know, you, you imagine how drastically things have changed in a five year, 20 year, even between yesterday and today. Um, for those of you listening, 
try and think back to um, your own life in the last couple of years. Um, 20 years is a lot. Uh, um, and it may be, it may feel totally different when a totally different world, um, but it's no different when it comes to company culture dynamics, um, honestly, and um, understanding how, so in that time I've watched trends at, as workplace um, changes and more importantly, I've seen um, which employee needs stay the same. And that is what has main, remained the um, focus of how defining the people's strategy and culture has helped me so far. Um, my job right now is twofold, is to um, capture what truly is fundamental um, for the team to thrive um, and also help nurture them as individuals. Because even if as their team, it's also about nurturing the individuals who are in those roles. Um, most companies, um, ours inclusive, um, do their best when each team can access the tools they need um, to uniquely grow in their roles and as people in the community. So um, you will fail in some of the ideas and strategies you come up with, but the bottom line is because what people individually need um, stays the same, you can focus on that, um, focus on what people absolutely need um, and then build on that to create your people's strategy. The thing is, the strategy for one company is totally different from the strategy from the next one. Um, so what you need to do is, like you mentioned in your slide, um, one of the things that is key is understanding how the board, the C-suite, wants to see the people and the culture and make them profitable and productive. Um, and once you can understand and define that um, from one business to the other, it's easier. And it's also easier when you have a uh, leadership that truly is interested in people, truly is interested in how people can come to work, bring out the best in themselves at work. And that, that's what we, that's the beauty and the advantage I've had working over the years, but then working now at ASA in the last um, almost three years and seeing that come to life. You know, you've watched things happen and then it comes to life. So my 20 year journey has been, uh, has been harrowing. I've had a lot of missteps, um, but the beauty is the best thing you can do is learn from those um, and then define what works best across teams, basically. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks, Fremo. Yeah. <clears throat> and how do you go about creating and then most importantly, I guess, maintaining an environment where people can bring their best self to work every day? OK, um, so sometimes it can be tough. They're tough decisions when you're um, dealing with people who don't embody the culture of the company, because it's we I work with a very diverse team. Yeah. And we come with our various ideas, various cultures, various upbringing. Um, but one of the major things I've noticed over the years is that employees can often feel like um, they don't have enough information about workflows, procedures, um, priorities, and that can help make them get caught up in a cycle of showing up to work feeling like everything is the most important thing. Um, that can end up being um, chaotic and often unfulfilling. Um, so what we've done as a business right now is um, we've tried to address what and this by developing a robust training um, program um, that really spends time to develop each employee's unique value and then guide them towards confidence in the role that they hold. Um, by doing this, it allows um, space for each team member to thrive in their external facing role and also in their internal facing role. Um, we've partnered with um, different organizations and different um, providers to ensure that we can keep expanding um, our business model, um, which basically is more about, which is really focused in Africa um, and ensuring that we can conduct a profitable trade to and from Africa. Um, our employees have access to a wealth of tools um, from our partners, and one of those partners is Lattice. Um, <laughs> Love the plug. Thank <laughs> you. It's right. good to do that. Um, um, so basically, um, but with using these tools, 
we ensure that they understand the wealth of what these tools look like. We've created a couple of programs um, as a business over the years. Um, one of them recently, actually, I, I don't know if I mentioned it to you before, Frankie, was um, to look for a way to empower African women um, in the tech industry um, to further their careers, um, basically. Um, this program ended. Um, we started it off, I think, sometimes it was the end of 2021, and it rounded up a few months ago. What we basically did was we partnered with one of um, one of our other partners, <laughs> um, they're called Now. It's powered by Beautiful Soul, which is a coaching company out of, believe it or not, Senegal. Um, mm -hmm. We ran for nine months. We had about um, several hundred women from different mid levels. Um, the goal was to help empower them, mentor them, put them in internship programs, um, which helped create a pipeline not only to be hired globally, but also to be hired where we had needs. And that helped a lot. And what we do is we make it an open and honest thing for employees to share their ideas, tell us what you know they think would work. Not, we don't shut down ideas. We look at it, we process it. Um, and then at the end of the day, you find out what works. You find out what makes them happy. It's not, the, so the thing about people operations or human resources is, it's, there's no exact science to it, you know? All of us are looking for the best way to be profitable, to be useful. Um, and people as individuals also wanna be that way. So the goal is, you know, as tough as it might look and you might make decisions, make sure you are creating um, policies, programs, and then maintaining it. It's not just about creating it. It's about maintaining it and making sure that um, people are a part of it. Um, we create poll surveys through Lattice. We create poll surveys, ask questions, you know, and people can tell us what works, what doesn't work. Um, we try it. If it's if it fails, we learn from the mistakes and then we move on from there. So there's no perfect science to it. Just keep doing the best you can. And the truth is, it will work out. You see the results. And when the results come, it's with great pride at the end of the day. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that that point about, you know, maintaining it and making sure you're acting on whatever mm. insights you get is so crucial, so important. There's there's no point running, you know, pulse surveys and getting that really important feedback if you're not then going to turn it into action. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, brilliant. And then Premo touching on, you know, so many financial services businesses as a finance has gone through a period of rapid, rapid growth. Um, what are some of the unique challenges that that's brought for you and your team and, and how have you handled that? Um, so the HR team role changes as the growth becomes more rapid and the need for processes. So absolutely, it's key to focus on the things that work and then the unique challenges that comes with it. Um, as a finance is in a sector where it's really taking off, um, um, to brag a bit about our business, we are Go for like, it. <laughs> we're the largest fintech in Africa. Um, what that basically does is that, we're, and then we're the only ones who are very, we're one of the very few who focus on business B2B. Um, so we're filling an enormous gap, you know, we're expanding the way companies do business um, with Africa to the extreme. Um, and it's remarkable because um, it comes with rapid growth. You see things happen. Um, you have to keep up with clients, you have to keep up with partners. Um, and I've seen from years of experience that um, growth like this can be really amazing or it can really be uncomfortable. Um, I think one of the ways in which we've, we've been um, lucky enough to succeed or driven, not necessarily lucky, to succeed is that um, as our headcount grew, um, our founder, Elizabeth, um, found had us had a sit down and started looking for ways in which we could empower our people more and more so um in the beginning um we started having we decided it was necessary to develop a more strategic um, and formal culture as well as values and guidelines um we focused on what was priority for people um we had we did off sites um, where we flew people from when we were 50, we will fly people all over. Um, even when we're 100, we'll fly people to one location um, because there's some level of 
um, camaraderie that happens when that when that takes off. Um, but the thing is, um, it was important to ensure that we facilitate opportunities to bond. So Elizabeth was very um, particular about that because we were in various places. It was key for us. Um, and another thing was that we always put, um, it was key to put clear career trajectories in place. So we set up that model. We set up the processes with the, your leadership track, what it looks like. Um, and we made sure that information was accessible to people at all phases um, in their working life. Um, communication needs to be constant. You can't, you can't shy away from it. You can't hide um, from it because the more people are informed about things, the easier it is to get them, get their buy-in. Um, you can't let a, a young employee sit down for two years and hope that they're going to get a promotion. You have to be able to tell them what it is about. And so um, one of the reasons why, honestly, and I'm going to brag a lot is why we needed to do certain things in order to achieve some of this, we needed to, in order to do this with our rapid growth, um, ex the people expect, um, professionals expect to see um, constant 360 degree um, evaluations, constant feedback. Um, and we were able to do this um, using Lattice where people wanted to see how they contributed to the growth of the business. They wanted to understand that how, what their part was in achieving our results. And um, partnering with Lattice has helped us do that. Um, we, want an, we want everyone to feel supported and valued here. So um, we created a, we're creating constantly, it's never perfect, but we're creating a culture constantly, which is um, luckily driven, like I said, by our founder, Elizabeth, who um, is very key, keen about how people are when they come to work. And so you create a culture, you create um, constant communication, you make sure that it's open and honest feedback is happening. Everyone sees when a shout out or cause, um, and all the shout outs are connected to our core values. Um, and people um, then get a sense of what the business is about, that as, that as we're growing rapidly, you are growing with us. You see where you're going. If one doesn't know the where they're going and why they have to do what they do when they get there, you will lose them along the way. So um, constant feedback, um, constant reviews, um, and these reviews don't have to be formal. It can just be month to month. We are very passionate, passionate about our um, monthly check-ins or weekly check-ins, um, feedback status. Um, it's key. You can, and the beauty is you can request feedback easily. You can give feedback. You work on a project together. You can see how you contributed to that project. Um, so if you make all these available, no matter how rapid the growth becomes, you feel a part of it. You 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 participate in it constantly. So I think that's what has helped us. Um, it can be challenging because we didn't come to this point um, so easily. We've done it manually over time, but we've always focused on being innovative, on collaborating, and that has helped um, us a lot. So, yeah. <laughs> Such an important point you made, Premo, as well about, you know, when a company goes through that rapid growth stage, the individual employees need to feel like they're getting to enjoy and take part and benefit from exactly. that growth as well, right? Exactly. Like, otherwise, you see that disconnect. Yes, yes. Um, and again, you know, given the nature of, of your business and international money transfers, you've got offices in a huge number of international locations. Yeah. How have you managed that shift to the new world of work post sort of COVID and, and what level of customization or changes have you had to sort of make for those different locations? So, um, like I mentioned before, we have offices in various locations. Um, the thing is, pre-COVID, we always had offices in more than one country. Um, our major focuses were Nigeria, Kenya, um, London, where we had our biggest offices, Spain, um, and recently South Africa. Um, what we basically have done over the years is, apart from the off-sites, which were bringing people together in the beginning, um, we've always worked, You can. I, I'm, I'm a boss who, currently lives in the UK, but my team members are spread all over. It's always been that way as a business. Um, even before COVID came and everyone had to work from home or we didn't have to work in the office, your team or your team members were always, for our business, was always in a different location from where you were. 
um, post-COVID, we had to do a good sit down and ask ourselves what was key, what was important, um, how profitable and productive were we during COVID? You had to do that analysis. Um, it was key for us to go back to the office because there's something about coming together that just fuels you to do it more. Um, we know that um, during COVID, people went through a lot of burnout or mental um, well-being became very important and became a focus. So um, before we chose, so not right now we do a um, hybrid um, or remote program um, as a, we create that environment for people. So what we first did was um, do a check, um, check in with people. What do you want? Um, what do, would you like to see? Um, would you like to come into the office? And so we phased our hybrid program where um, we started by going in once a week and then we increased it to twice a week. Um, and then we also made it possible for people, we created a remote, remote working framework um, that helped people understand that, okay, if I'm choosing to go remote, here is what is re required of me. This is how I'm supposed to work. This is how I'm supposed to function. Um, in that framework, we even also made it possible for you to work um, temporarily from anywhere um, without changing your contract um or the, that sounds like a miracle i don't know no. how it is. <laughs> no <laughs> no the administrative brain work of having to manage you in different countries is not a joke so um you, it, so for example i'm originally from nigeria and i and i live in the uk um if i want to go visit my family um at home um i can choose to travel and work from Nigeria um, for a given period of time, once it's, you know, cleared up with um, my boss, with my IT team, with HR, <laughs> um, I, and I can do that. Um, and um, uniquely, we, 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 we've, we've seen it, we've seen the team do great, you know, um, it, it, we, we understand that when you value people and you invest in who they are as people, um, it becomes easier and then you can plan strategically for what is to come. Um, post COVID, we've only gotten better. We've um, changed the way we um, do our interactions. Good thing is we can now meet, in, we can now meet physically. Um, so we take advantage of that on a quarterly basis. Um, we, as a team, um, we ensure that people can meet together, um, work it out, have fun. Um, discuss stuff. We have off-site either physically or virtually, whichever works great um, at every point in time. Um, the, the, the truth about this is it's good to find what works best for you as a business. For Azza, we found our rhythm and that rhythm is working for us right now. For some of the businesses, they're remote first and um, they stick to remote and can be in multiple places. But we found out that because our culture is people, interaction, um, fueling off one another. It's easier for us to um, do set up the programs that work. So we have a hybrid program, we have a remote working program, and um, they've been doing so great. Our hybrid program has more than 70% of our people choosing to be hybrid. Um, those who are choosing to be um, remote, you know, they still, when there's a quarterly event and they can come together and they're in the location where we have an office, they will come together and then keep the interaction um, going. So it won't be easy. Um, there is no specific customization that you can pick. But the thing is, if you don't try um, and see how that can scale, that can be scaled and continue to do it, um, you will keep you will you you will keep yourself in a silo. So it's better to open up to others, ask questions, interact with it, and then bring that idea or that sell that to get the buy-in of leadership, and it will be easier to 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 move along. Basically, yeah. <clears throat> no, it's so funny. I, I always use this example um, about the like remote work situation. My my fiance works for a company that when COVID happened, they went fully remote. When things calmed down, they were hybrid. And at first they were, it was just hybrid kind of open. And most people were going into the office two or three days a week out of choice and working from home two or three days a week. Mm -hmm. um, and then the company out of the blue suddenly announced that 
they were everyone was now going to be required to go into the office two days a week. Yeah. And it, it was so funny how all the people who were, you know, doing that voluntarily anyway, the second that they felt like it was just coming down as an order and they hadn't been consulted, everyone pushed back. Yeah. And yeah. everyone was yeah. like, so it's like you said, that consulting. Yeah. That, that Honestly, Frankie, that actually will happen because our initial fear was if we go hybrid and we don't give the option, we will, we, there's a possibility of, you know, having people quit. And you don't want that because that means additional hiring costs and that means new onboarding. My gosh, the cost of it was beyond. So it was, it's easier to be open with people and get their honest feedback, inform them about what you intend to do get their buy-in, you know, get their buy-in. And the truth is once you get the buy-in and give them an understanding of what it is and why it is you're doing what you do, it's easier to sell it. It's easier, yeah. (laughs) As as an XPR person, I understand that need to, you know, sell the idea. Yeah. Um, (laughs) um and I mean obviously uh, we've just spoken about people leaving a business potentially it's it's always disappointing when a great employee leaves a business how do you handle that process and like how do you make sure that that door stays open if if, you know they want to come back so um companies around the globe are facing the same problem you know um it's basically how to attract and retain a workforce Um, with new and different expectations for their career, you know. Um, It's a huge part of our work, of course. And um, so the goal was for us was to ensure that we could create an environment where great employees don't want to leave in the first place. (laughs) It's not that people don't leave, but what we do at AZA is we work to solve the issue of emphasizing that um, people are empowered. um, So we emphasize empowerment. Um, like I said, we clearly communicate your career trajectory so you know where we're doing, what, where you're going. Um, we work a lot on this so that it can be very hard for us to find people. Um, it can be very hard for us to find people who fit our unique company culture. And in the same way, um, people will move on. But when they do, um, we prioritize our communication. Um, to ensure that as they leave, we have a good exit interview to understand what it was, if there's some things we can tweak. Um, My uh, The other people team um, works hard, really hard in understanding people's needs um, and then aligning those needs with incentives accordingly. Um, And if employees want or need to move across the country, across the world, it's very important that we can support them flexibly in terms of contracts and location where we possibly can. Um, But in cases where employees have had to move on um, and they go, um, we keep the door open. You know, the door is open where we tell them, you know, we value you. See, the learning curve for for an employee who has been in the system Um, And with the open door, knowing that they can come back, the learning curve is shorter for you. Imagine someone who doesn't know your business enough and wants to start. The onboarding process would take longer than someone who has been um, around for a while. And the advantage, we had a couple of people leave over the last few years, but this year was big for us at AZA and even my HR team. We've had about four or five people return you know, that's insane. That is amazing. Open. Like the truth is, if you're an amazing performer, if you've done good work, if you understand our culture, um, and we celebrate that even while you're away, we keep it open. We're working towards like an as alumni where love it employees, you know, can stay in and interact and um, understand how the business works. Um, it's scary when you go out there and you see something new. But because you know, at the back of your head, is like coming back home. You know, I can move out of my house today. My kids can say, oh, mom, I want to go live on my own. But I always give them the understanding that the door is open. You can come back at any time. If I'm scared about anything, I can run home to my mom. I'm old, but I can still run home to my mom. It's the same way we keep that open. We keep that culture open where um, you can come back. I've had people on my team, especially. I've had two people on my team come back. And it made it easier because I needed to grow that team and do more. And we were expanding rapidly. And I needed people who understood the business. So it was easier to bring those people back. They knew the culture. They had worked hard. But they wanted to go try something else. So 
we do have an open door for you to come back. You reach out if there's an, but the thing is, if there's an availability, you know that you, the chances of you getting back into that position is high. But be, we don't want you to leave in the first place. But the truth is, change is, change is constant. It's always going to happen. People are always want to go, want to go or move on. But um, if you keep the door open, um, and then they reach out and say, hey, um, is there anything up open or they see a vacancy? They, my email is available. Anyone, they can, even if they don't mail me, they mail the people operations team collectively. And then we're checking. And then our TA team, is, our talent acquisition team is checking in with the manager. Oh, this person worked here before. This is what they're doing now. You know. So because that is there, as scared as we are, uh, normal you will be scared when people move um but you because you have that door open it's easier to bring people back on and it has been a success story for us um to keep the door open it's very rare um in a lot of companies today but here at Azza, it's it's important for you to know that you may be moving on you didn't leave because um we did anything wrong <laughs> you wanted to explore and it's okay you want to be adventurous you want to see what's out there but know that you can come home and that 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 i think that's when we conduct those en exit interviews which i conduct myself personally um i put that out there you know come back if you if you reach out if there's something talk to us um and i just have to I just have to understand what it is you're looking for new if we have something that it's available and, and it helps and it helps. And that has driven our culture. And people see that everybody else within the system sees that and are like, OK, this is where we want it. This is what we want to see. And uh, um, doesn't encourage them to go because it's expensive to replace. But, you know, if you keep the door open, you know, those still in the system and those who have left, understand that you have a culture that believes in people and it makes it easier yeah i mean that really is a massive testament to what to what you've built uh, as a finance promo the fact that you've had that many employees you know come back to return and like you said people want to go explore they want to go try a new challenge and yeah. sometimes it's not what they thought it was going to be and like you said yeah. the fact that they feel they can always come home to Azza and you know come home to you is is just incredible yeah um, and we have these two questions that, that we're asking every speaker um, in, in the For the Love of People series promo towards the end. So I'll, I'll start these now. And just before I do, um, for all our viewers, if you have any questions you'd like to ask promo, um, you can start putting those into the Q&A tab and I'll get to those in about 10 minutes time, probably maybe a little less. Um, so, yeah, promo, if you could go back in time and give yourself, doesn't have to be exactly three, but you know, a couple of pieces of advice at the start of your HR journey, yeah. what would they be and why? So, um, so I used to think I was the only HR person who felt that I had an imposter syndrome. <laughs> This came up in our last episode. I was in a well. conversation yesterday with someone in a, at a dinner, which was for people, um, HR um, leaders. And in that conversation, I'm like, the person was like, oh, sometimes I think that my programs are just useless, you know? And then you see it happen. Um, no, one of the things I'll tell my younger self is um, don't be afraid to bring up your ideas. Don't be scared. Um, it might look crazy, it might look like it's not going to work, but if you put your heart to it, it would work, one. Two, make sure you have a network of people who are like-minded. We always want to work in silos, we always want to work with in you know, on our own. Um, since signing up with Lattice, there's this resource for um, humans um, Slack channel that I've been a part of. Um, there I can gather as much information about stuff. You know, I can go in there and ask questions and people are asking questions and I'm answering and it's interactive and it's so cool. So find a network. I didn't get a network early enough. I'm, I was a total introvert and people don't get it that I used to be an introvert. Um, so I didn't know how to interact with people. I, I could do great public speaking, but um, I wasn't very good at that. So that's one thing. Um, another thing you must never stop doing is learning. Um, never stop learning. 
the world of work is changing really, really quickly, really rapidly. And if you don't stay abreast with what is happening, you're going to get lost. You're going to become you're going to become, for lack of a better word, extinct. And you don't want that to happen. So um, if I could tell myself something else, I would be do more courses, learn more, expand more, um, grow your network even better. Um, and then don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid. Um, you will make mistakes. You will fall. But the truth is you fall and stand up. If you, if you don't fall 40 times, you know, as long as you keep picking yourself up, um, you will get there. I have made tons of mistakes, <laughs> tons of mistakes in my career. Um, I've taken the wrong job. I've um, worked with the wrong people. I've trusted the wrong people, but that doesn't stop me from still trusting people. That doesn't stop me from still wanting to be the best um, at what I do. Still doesn't stop me from feeling like, okay, you're, you're an imposter. But <laughs> um, every day I remind myself, um, today I'm going to do the best I can. Today I'm going to make sure that people can come. I can we, I can work to ensure that we're creating the programs, the well-being, the incentives, the compensation, whatever it is that employees need so that when they come to work, they come with their best selves. So don't stop doing that. That's it. <laughs> That was amazing. Thank you, Primo. <laughs> um, and then one more question for you. I always joke it's the crystal ball gazing question. Yeah. Um, as you said yourself, you know, we've seen so much change in HR and in the workplace in the past couple of years. What do you think are the key challenges facing the industry for, you know, for next year, for 2023? And it, what, if anything, can HR teams do to kind of get ahead of them? Okay, so right now, beautiful thing is this came at a time when I'm basically doing a retro about 2022 and Amazing. what went great, what didn't go great, what are the learning points, what could I have done differently? And that would, is going to help spur um, my goals for 2023. But I believe that 2023 will bring more permanency um, to the nuance of how and where we work. Um, the hybrid program is here to stay. The remote working program is here to stay. Um, we're coming out of a stage of temporary remote work and realizing that these models, the um, remote and hybrid models, are really working for a large part of our teams. And so that's we're going to keep encouraging that. Um, the best thing we can do as HR teams is to plan like this is permanent because it is there's nothing you can't change it it's a it's a movement that has happened and there's no going back now there's no, there's no going back so keep what you need to do in 2023 is create the models that will exist like i said earlier create and maintain so create the models that will you know that are scalable that will continue to grow um hr teams should be developing strategies that uniquely support people who never come into the office. Um, those who come in um, part-time um, or hybrid, um, those who come in every day, because there are some people who just love to come in every day. You know, one of my colleagues who comes in every day and I'm like, dude, you know, but, um, and of equal importance, um, we should be paving the way for all employees, no matter their working model, to consistently and richly connect with each of them um, where we can create the environment um, for them. Um, Another thing that's going to be really key in 2023 is um, growth um, as people, um, as individuals in their careers, in their jobs, how they do things better, how they would improve themselves, um, have the right grow, <laughs> which you can get on Lattice, um, you know, have the right competencies, know where you're going, have your plans set out, um, work with them to understand it. There's going to be, the, the world has come to a point where a lot of budgets are going to be really lean. So use, so take advantage of that. Use the best, use your budgets where it's, you're ensuring that you're empowering people, you're finding the right um, programs for people. Um, and then keep doing it. Just keep doing it. You will fail in some, but the, 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 what you should have at the back of your head is, I want people to achieve. I want people to excel. And if you keep doing that, um, your strategies will, you know, will be defined and, and maintained properly. That, that's what 2023 looks like. <laughs> Love it. Thank you, Premo. Um, mm -hmm. And I can see we've already got some questions coming in in the Q&A. Um, so I will start working my way through those. Okay. Um, so Michaela asked, how do you deal with the time difference of remote working, especially given you're working across so many time zones, I imagine? So we've we've been 
we've had the advantage of having people who work in a time zone that is not more than three hours apart. So we try to ensure that our meetings and our collaborations and our interactions happen within a certain time. We are cognizant of each person's time. We're cognizant of each person's hours. Um, we don't have yet um, call business hours, but we don't have it defined, but you know, at the back of your head, I know I'm not gonna schedule a meeting with someone who is in Kenya, for example, um, who is three hours or in Joburg, who is three hours um, at 6 p.m. my time, that's unfair, you know? Um, so it's hard, um, but you work at it. We have a few thrown around in Australia, in Canada. <laughs> um, but they've been, I'm, I'm amazed how they've been, they've just chosen to understand that this is for family reasons, most of them have had to move. And so they've worked with it and it's been successful for them. They've remained productive. And we, like I said, just create the environment and people would tailor their lives to what you need. We, we've, it's not been too diverse for us because we're still in like a three hour time zone across, but we, we've made it work and it, it's, got, it's gone good. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I'd add to that as well. In my previous job, um, we were a UK business launching mm -hmm. into Australia as our first international market. So dealing with pretty much the worst time zone difference yeah. you could possibly yeah. have and making sure that you have really good tools and processes in place that allow your team to do asynchronous communication um, mm -hmm. was another really core cool thing that we found helped mm -hmm. us a lot. You know, so you don't always have to every single day wake up really early or stay up really late to get yeah. on that Zoom call with someone. Yeah. You've got tools and processes that allow mm -hmm. you to, you know, leave notes, share call recordings. Exactly, you know, exactly. Kind of exactly. Um, and next up, we have a question from Gemma. Uh, do you have employees who don't want opportunities to connect socially or build relationships or community? And how do you handle that preference when you're developing culture. I guess maybe those more introverted people. I know. <laughs> oh my gosh, you don't, you don't, you don't know the last of it. The truth <laughs> is <laughs> there are people who just don't want to connect. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's scary. It, they just don't want to connect. And I'm thinking to myself, how do you function? Um, so what we've, what I've, what I try to do, um, first of all, as head of people is as much as possible, have interactive sessions with people. Um, one of the things we also try to ensure that we do is um, we get, because we ensure that there's a weekly or monthly one-on-one -on -one check ins with your manager, also opens up the door for when there are issues or challenges, the managers can reach out. Um, it's an open it's a Slack, you know, and you can talk to one another about that. Um, it's not easy to build, um, but like I said, on a quarterly basis, we, on in each jurisdiction or in each location, we try to create um, a program where even if you're, so if you're in London and for example, you live in York, um, you, we have an event and you it's pre-planned. You can come in and spend a day with everybody and that helps and it help, helps to increase that. For those who are remote um, because they're in different parts and they can't even travel to any particular office, we create programs for them as well, um, where they can do murder mystery hunts and, you know, make it fun and interesting. It's it's not easy, um, but the truth is on all platforms, on all channels, we're constantly communicating our culture, talking about who we are. Um, we give up, we send out monthly um, newsletters that tell them what's happening, what's going on. And when I haven't, and honestly, when um, if I check on Lattice and I see that one-on-ones haven't accorded with a particular manager and the team member for a while, I'm reaching out to the manager and I'm reaching out to the individual just to understand what's happening. So you need to be a hands-on HR person um, involved with what is going on. It's not easy. And I have an amazing team who helps me do it. My team makes me, they turn me into a queen every day and I'm like, just, I just sit back and get it done. But yeah, it's not going to be easy, um, Gemma, but you need to find what works uniquely for you as a business and then um, try. The truth is you're still going to have people who are not going to be a part of it. Yeah. You create programs, they won't want to come. If they're, if they're not coming, doesn't affect the overall culture or them as individuals not being available. It doesn't change them as being different. Um, it's just a choice. 
find a way to work with it um, and embrace it. And the truth is eventually they will, they will come. Eventually, yeah. Because people like interaction. People like people. Eventually. I love that. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> and because I know you you said in our previous chat promo, you know, how important it is that, you know, yeah, if someone isn't fitting with your culture, you, you do need to address that. But as you said, it, as long as that, that person's preference isn't impacting the culture as a whole, you know, and as you said, eventually they'll they'll get yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, amazing. Okay. And next up from Deborah. What's your well-being strategy to check in on employees and ensure they're doing well in a remote first environment? Uh, I, I mentioned it earlier where um, the, by checking how the one-on-ones are happening, um, we're doing that. It's, we're not remote first. Let me quickly say that. But um, because it doesn't matter where you are, um, our benefits programs is it cuts across. Um, we have a, a global benefits program. So whatever applies one place applies everywhere else. And then it's broken down according to countries. I want to move to Spain. It's broken down according to countries. Um, but um, the truth is your well-being strategy needs to be about the people and how well they work. Um, like I said earlier, if I notice that one-on-ones are not occurring enough with a particular manager and then because the reason why one-on-ones happen is so that constant feedback can occur. Um, you can understand where some where someone is feeling uncomfortable or not able to perform at the, or bring in their best selves. Um, you don't wait for the review, um, either media or quarterly or end of year reviews or performance reviews. It has to be constant. And if you keep that going, um, for well-being, we've Apart from the wellness programs that we have, we have various clubs, um, yoga, I'm missing yoga right now, you know. <laughs> um, we have a yoga club, we have a book club, we have different clubs um, that, that adds to it. We've partnered with um, a therapy company to help people when it comes to the well, well-being. Um, we have mental health days um, where you can take time off. Um, our Mondays are no meeting Mondays where you log in and you catch up on your administrative work. Um, we're hoping to launch programs in the new year where um, it's called a, a, an as a day where you have, and we bought that idea from Lattice, where you have the day where you recharge, um, you can close early, you want to spend time with family. So nothing, like I said, HR is not an exact science. You need to find out what works great for your organization, what works for one team, one organization may not work for the next. As that is, we try new things every day. Um, what works we keep and maintain, what doesn't work we scrap, you know, be, be, be open enough to say this is not working and, and move on from there. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Thanks, Premo. And a- another question you mentioned earlier, you know, you're fortunate enough now to have a, a founder who really does care about mm-hmm. people in HR. But Laura asks, how have you overcome uh, dealing with leaders who are more focused on targets rather than people? OK, so I have had work I've had in my career. I've worked with owners of businesses who have been more focused about the targets than the people. And it's hard because you're the people person, you're stuck in the middle. Um, you're having to get the people to the point where you want, where the business needs them to be. Um, and then the people having to catch up with that as well. So you're stuck in the middle. You're like, you're like the umpire or you're like the mom who is protecting one person or the other, so to speak. Sorry, I use mom, but I'm a mom. I can only use things that I'm used to. Um, So first off, you need to help. You need to, whatever programs and people strategy you're working with, you don't share it. You have to share it first with the leadership. One, you have to understand what the leadership wants. I have the advantage of a founder. Sorry. I have the advantage of a founder, Elizabeth, is about the people. She has said one too many times, I would rather not make money than have a bad culture or have a have a toxic environment. That's one of the reasons why she set up this business, um, apart from ensuring that um, we could reach, as Africa could reach, um, and vice versa. It was more about ensuring that people can come to work and be at home, for lack of a better word, being a family. The truth is, in families, we, we quarrel, we fight. I, I, I can shout at my sister or my brother today and be angry at my kids, but we're family. You always have to have that at the back of your head. So 
first off, you the, yes, they're worried about, because at the end of the day, as much as we want a culture that is not toxic, we also want to meet our goals. We also yeah. want to meet the target. Um, with Lattice, you can see how you contribute to the company's objectives um, using the goal feature. But um, when you have leaders who are more focused about the goals, you need to find a unique way um, that helps them understand that without the people, we won't be able to achieve the targets. So if you don't create the people programs, there's so many programs that are actually inexpensive. If you don't create the people programs that would help that, they will never meet their targets. They will never. If you keep, you know, you need to show them both ends. This is key. And try and understand them as individuals and what works for them as individuals. And maybe that would help. It's like I said, it's, 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 it's not an exact science. It's an, it takes a lot of intuition, hard work, um, processes, trying and trying and trying, and then finding what works eventually. I hope Laura, that helps. It's not easy. I've been there. I've had to work away from biz a business because we were, ke we kept clashing. We kept clashing because oh, you can't do this. You can't do this. This is what applies. This is how the people are thinking. This, if we do this, people, you will get the best out of people. And I walked away. It was easier to do that. Than to stay and try and battle. Yeah, to stay and it. try, yeah. 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 Um, amazing answer. Thank you, Premo. And apologies in advance because I'm going to butcher this name, I think. Either Kiara or Chiara, we have a question from you. Um, how do you manage the contracts of people working from so many different locations? Um, prior, prior to now, we just let them work as contractors. Um, recently, we had the advantage of partnering with a global um, payroll provider um, who then help us with... Um, um, employer of record um, contracts because like I said earlier we we have a standard company-wide benefit program where everyone must have medical insurance must have must, must pay your taxes you must so those things and there was a burden on people having to do it themselves so we had to find a partner to do that so we found a partner I'm not going to sell them here I'm sorry people but um, we found a partner who helps us do that um, so we we on that platform we can we can manage those contracts from various locations. And um, like I said, I have an amazing team. My team is um, the workers' business partners for different locations, different divisions. Um, I've had, I have the luck of having them spread across a major of our com offices um, in Kenya, in the UK, in Nigeria, in South Africa, um, in Uganda, and they've helped, um, and in Spain, and they've helped me get that done. Um, but you have to understand and work closely with your legal team and understanding the employment laws in those individual countries. What works, make sure you're working with it. Don't break, don't break the rules. Make sure you fit into the rules. Um, like I said, we keep it standard. Where we can make it available, we make it available. Where we can't, we monetize um, and hope that the person is doing what it is they need to do. Um, working with this payroll partner has taken that burden off us um, and it's easier. So find, find what works for you um, and you get there. Amazing. Thanks, Premo. I know we've still got quite a few more questions left, but we're yeah. pretty much out of time. So what I yeah. do, I mean, obviously this proves we need to have you back again soon, Premo, <laughs> for another session. Um, but I will make sure we share Premo's LinkedIn with everyone in the follow-up email. Um, mm. so that of course, you can connect with her and, and follow up. Um, on top of that, as I said, uh, we will have our next episode of For the Love of People ready for sign up. So I'll share that with everyone as well. But Premo, it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I, I really can't speak highly enough of you. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time out to do this with us. Um, and for all our viewers, have a wonderful rest of your day, wherever you are in the world. Um, and <laughs> we will hopefully see you all again for another For the Love of People soon. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank Bye you, everyone. everyone. Thank